it's nobody's. In, in Intel CT, it was nobody's fault. Everybody's doing the best they can with what they have. It just now, thankfully, the world's changed. And just like when GPS was invented, I can't find my way home from my own office without GPS. I really can't. Um, but now with GPS, I can. It takes me less time to, to wander. So with these, with new perspective, you can do more. You can do more faster. These difficult decisions, what should I do? When the patient's in pain, maybe it's transfer pain. Maybe it isn't what, maybe you're not in the right area. Maybe it's something different. It could, it could be a fracture somewhere in the mandible. There's a lot of different things going on that you can see when you have the perspective. So you can just see different types of dentistry. It applies to everybody. So uh, impactions, just, just approaching. When you're planning this, is this easy to plan? It might be, but it just gets a whole lot easier when you can see from different angles. So back to perspective. It is all about perspective, and that's what this gives you. Um, not raised case, I'm in San Francisco. <laughs> and so you have a pocket, and then a pocket, and here's one version of treatment planning. Here's a different version where we can actually go through, and we can see how far that paraplegia extends. You can come in from the top and see where it's circling each root to. So you have that perspective, and that's really what, what CT is all about. And again, what I like, I was showing the, the axial, going from the top down. Because you're, unless, oh, I, it's rare when you are doing surgery in slices, going mesial distal. You're coming in apically. So why not take a look right from the palpal chamber and start going down and let's see at which point we start seeing that, that lesion. Let's see how far it extends. So those different views, these different tools, it's really powerful. And I'll show you, I'll show you soon how I like to slice and dice to, to give the answers quickly. But whether you own a CT, whether you're sitting somewhere else, I mean, if, if you want to send to me, great, I'll always take more. But whatever you're doing with CT, just realize what's possible and how it can really, really help you and help your patients. So, back for me, stay focused. So, when using a CT, this is the whole push planning thing. And it's something, well, if you own it, great. If you don't, and you're sending out something to, to really check and make sure it's being done right, just like when you're referring out to a specialist, you want to make sure they're taking care of your patients and doing what they should be doing. So how do you plan for these things? Um, I said I was going to stay focused and I lied. I, uh, so since getting married, my, my driving arsenal consists of a Prius and a minivan. So, Ray and Chris on the bike playing cops were faster than I am. Um, but I snuck out and went to, on Sears Point up, up by Vallejo, they have an Audi racetrack, and I was I zipped around here with my friend Mike. And, and when we're doing this, what got me was the instructors in this front car in an Audi TT, which you can buy. It's a 40,000 more car, it's nice, beats my Prius. And we're in back, we, the rookies, we're in back in these. R10 V8 expensive cars, and one was an Iron Man. I mean, these are like, these are showpiece cars. Way more than I should ever handle. And I joked with the, with the instructor who's in front, showing us the curves, showing us how to do things. I said, you know, buddy, as soon as you teach us this, we're just going to dust you. I mean, thank you, but you're, you know, why don't you just have a tricycle? And he laughed, and he said, all right, let's go. And after the first 20 seconds, I didn't see him until he laughed me. <laughs> which was fast. And how did he do it? Well, he knows where to take the turns. He knows when to accelerate, when to decelerate, how fast to go. I'm lucky I didn't kill myself sliding around in his car. And so it's, it's not so much the machine as knowledge of how to use it. And that doesn't just go to cars. 
It also goes to photography. And, you know, again, went to Yosemite, had a great time. I've got a nice little SLR camera. I'm not going to be Ansel Adams overnight. <laughs> I may never be. But if I want to try, I've got to take some serious classes, put in some serious time, and really, really educate myself. And there's a difference. So in using CT, if you've got it and you're having your, your assistant just go hit the button, it's not a big person, little person, child. There's a lot you have to take into account. We actually go completely off factory settings. We've done a lot of experiments and actually read some really interesting articles by ENTs who recommend studies, clinical studies, that say don't, the factory settings are great for the sweet spot, 60% of, of your patients, but you're, you're going to want to vary to get high quality images based on different patient factors. And it can be size, it can be a lot of different things, but we'll vary them. Just, just like you'll vary shutter speed and aperture on the camera. Just like you'll vary driving speed on a course. We'll vary patient position. The machine goes around the patient. It goes around their head, not their whole body. So if they don't have much of a neck, if they're cathodic and leaning forward, you're all of a sudden doing this really weird yoga move, trying to get it right. And if they're, if they're younger, they shake more, you'll speed it up, you'll slow it down based on different factors. So position matters. Metal, as Chris showed, will, will vary the KV and EMA based on how much metal's in their mouth. And the biggest thing is to know your goal. Know why you're scanning. Because why you're scanning determines how you scan. Just like when a patient walks in, walks in your operatory, you pretty much have to know why the patient's there. You don't start off raising right as an endophile for each patient. You have to know why they're there. And then keep training. Keep on whatever, whatever, whatever you're doing. Keep doing it. Keep training to be good. But this is you know why. If this patient came in for an implant on 30 and that was it, and one of my staff nuked their whole head, I'd be really upset. We'd have a long dialogue. If this patient came in for a root canal on five, even if this patient came in for a, a full arch, all in four, um, full arch center case, unless we're doing TMJ or chiropractic or something else, why give them this much radiation? Why do this to them? And also it's going to vary what your resolution is. So there's a lot of things I'm not, I'm not here to teach how to do CT, but I'm here to impress upon you that it takes a lot of thought, a lot of training to get this right. It's, it's totally doable, but you have to make sure someone's, if not you, someone's doing it. And so I'm a big fan of limited volume. Just shoot what you need. It's less radiation. It limits your focus as a clinician, and it also limits your liability. We, we do scan for lawyers. And so we do see cases where there's, you're, you're, putting, you're putting in an implant, a maxillary implant, a little periapical lesion on the other side of the mouth, and the patient takes no dental responsibility at all, and two years later, that's going to be an extraction. And the, pay, and the, the GP says, well, I'm sorry, you're going to have to go get a CT. We're going to see what's going on. And the patient says, I just had a CT. Why did they, why did they tell me then? Well, you should have. Um, and so you're some, and there's different schools of thought. Some doctors will say, I want you to get the whole head, I want to make sure everything's fine. Some will say, I want just the area of interest. Some will say, I don't care about the condyles, just get the oral cavity. But know what you're getting into, because you are liable, I mean, they're under your care. So if you're doing an implant, that's what you care about. If you're evaluating the entire mouth, that's what you care about. But there's no reason to zap everything if you don't need to. And if you do have a reason, okay, do it. Um, with the focus area scan, we, we do small ones. And in a lot of machines, we actually have a care stream. We're extremely happy with it. So um, we, uh, we also have Planmeca, Galileo, SciCat. I'm kind of like a, 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 a shopper, a hoarder, a, a hoarder of CTs. Um, <laughs> But uh, we're extremely happy, actually, with our stream, and it does these nice, small area scans. So you can just focus on what you need. And just like taking a picture with your camera, if I take a picture of this whole room, then 
I can see everybody. I can go home, show my wife that here's everyone who was there. If I zoom in on just Steve and say his whole face is the camera, it's going to be a little higher resolution, right? When you zoom in, it's just one person. So by zooming in, you can get better resolution. So that's good. It's lower radiation. For us, at least, it's lower cost. We charge 125 for the small scans, 285 for everything else. And again, it's lower liability because you're now doing a small area. And it really applies to one to three teeth. I mean, that's really what you're looking for. You'll get four or five, but I say keep it, you know, expect one to three. Implants, endo, impactions, really when you're isolating an area. And also just pain. When somebody's in pain and they don't know why. Back to that giant fenestration, when you're, you're asking yourself, should it be should it be a root canal? Should it be an extraction? What's going on? And just get that little area. That's, that's, where, that's really the sweet spot of it. So that's planning before you push the button. Now, what can you expect? And this is the non-implant side of CTs. We saw endo a little bit earlier. And typically with CT, when you're, when you're not using software, we'll show software later. But when you're not using software, you're just sitting out, or you're taking a picture and saying, give me the answers. You'll see one millimeter slices. It slices at one millimeter intervals, going in their bisecting the arch. And it's nice, I mean, I can see what's going on here. The problem, especially with endo, is a lot of things can hide between one millimeters. You know, these one millimeter increments. There's a lot of room for things to, to stay hidden. So I say we call it micro slices. So I'm no longer picking on Ray. Actually, this is my thank you. Ray one day said, hey, I heard about this special machine that does micro slices. It's like less than a millimeter. So we used to call it a zoom, which is just a tenth of a millimeter slices. But I thought micro makes so much more sense. So you can, when we do endo cases, then you can cut that up and do really small, fine slices. So there's less room for those fractures or, or extra canals to hide. Just a different perspective. My favorite with endo, again, is the ability to start at the pulpal chamber and start going down to where I finally see what's going on inside the bone. And this isn't a PA, by the way. We, we've gone in sagittally until you can see it. So we've adjusted that view. You know, a PA might have been hit, like Chris said, it's in the middle of the brick. So between these different views, hopefully you'll really be able to see what you need. And that's, that's the whole job, to give you that perspective. So that's, on endo, that's one way to cut it. Extractions are extractions. We'll map the nerve, the third molars. It's pretty straightforward, and the, the question here is, where is the nerve in relation to that cortical plate and that third molar? And you can really start to see how it gets pinched in certain spots. Sometimes we'll actually see it through the, through the buccal plate, the lingual plate. Never so often you'll see that compromised. But it's, again, this is a precursor to a treatment plan or an extraction. It just tells you more, gives you that perspective you need. I talked about impactions. Again, we're doing these slices. But it's, I find it's more interesting to go axially from the top down. Because the question is, how are we in communication with an A-brain tooth? Can you show me where? And so we're able to slowly go down and see that. Again, just something you don't get from that PA. Apnea and airway, I mean, that's, I'm not sure how else you would do it. And, oh, anybody do tracing in the room or orbital tracing? I used to. Used to? That's, that's like the, the black art, uh, just, just the whole tracing aspect, that's hard. Um, 2D tracing, it, it was done for a long time, just like I was the remote control for my family for a long time. But when you think about it, you're taking landmarks and you're creating measurements based on a profile, taking landmarks to determine orthodontic treatment. What happens if the patient's face isn't symmetric? When you're saying distance from the lower orbit to the nasion, the chin, 
upper palate. What happens if their eyes aren't symmetric, if their ears aren't symmetric? And how often are people like that? Well, quite frequently. Nobody's perfect. Um, so now, all of a sudden, this 2D tracing, it's better than nothing, but it's not perfect. So the ability to do 3D tracing and map everything out, it's, it's really powerful. I'm not a fan of 2D tracing now, knowing this. We actually send out to doctors. We have, we'll cut the images, but we want to have doctors do tracing. So we send out to orthodontists to actually do the tracing to get the correct results. It's just, it's just very, very